It's been a couple of weeks since my last video and in that time I've had the valve gear apart more times than I can count as I've been chasing through various problems. Firstly, the joints between the valve spindles, combination levers and radius rods. When first assembled, these parts would lock up due to lack of clearance and prevent the wheel sets from rotating through 360 degrees. To resolve this, I've had to modify the valve spindles to give more clearance for the ends of the radius rods and then open up the forks and reprofile these ends of the radius rods. In all fairness, I had not made a particularly good job of profiling these the first time around. Next, I had an issue with the eccentric rods in that they would not align correctly between the return cranks and the expansion links. This took quite a few hours to track down with me taking multiple measurements and reviewing the drawings repeatedly. Do remember of course that my design has offset many of these parts by one millimetres from the frames on both sides. In the end I traced the issue down to my least favourite of parts, the motion plates. Once identified the fix was to add shims between the motion plate frame brackets and the frames. This pushed the expansion links out a little bit further from the frames and allowed the eccentric rods to fit correctly. And whilst at it, I also decided to remake the top brackets. And again, I can be grateful that I haven't yet soldered these parts together. Clearly, the motion plates issue was down to me as a result of my poorly implemented change in design. However, I'm pretty sure the issue with the valve spindles, combination levers and radius rods was or is a design issue. But I am of course more than happy to be corrected. Moving on, I did say in the last video that I should make a tool to help me with fitting and removing the pins pressed into the various parts of the valve gear and I actually made two. The first is based very much upon a bicycle chain breaker but turned out to be a bit too small so I made another one from a small G clamp. Both have a 2.5mm silver steel pin fitted to push the pivot pins out with a hole drilled through the opposing side. When using them the tricky part is to get the hole aligned to the far side of the pin. And it's fair to say that these tools have had a lot of use. With the bulk of the valve gear now out of the way, I decide to get on with properly assembling the cylinder blocks, and by this I mean making them steam or airtight. First off are the gaskets, and I'll start with the steam chest. Making gaskets for square or rectangular parts is quite easy, as the part can usually be used as a template to cut around. However, care is required, as it's all too easy to cut into the part with a Stanley knife, especially brass. For the steam chests, I first use a cover to cut the outer profile and then use one of the steam chest bodies to draw the internal profile on the gasket material before cutting it out. Because the steam chests have a noticeable radius on the internal corners, I use a hole punch to cut these first and then go on to joining up the holes using a Stanley knife and ruler. To drill the bolt holes, I again use the steam chest body as a template. First I take a bit of time to get a small stack of gaskets aligned under the body and then I drill right the way through the gaskets into the wood below. For circular gaskets, such as the cylinder covers or valve spindle guides, my preference is to turn a die block and then use a soft hammer to cut the gaskets. Here I've turned the die block to the corresponding internal and external diameters for the cylinder covers.
and again I use the part as a template for drilling through for the bolt holes. For the cylinder covers I can only get three on the register so I cut three at a time. It's worth noting that I'm making quite a few spares whilst I'm doing this as I've no doubt I'll be needing them in the not too distant future. As I called out in part 32, Don's design calls for packing to go into the pistons to provide the seal between them and the cylinder wall. I've not worked with this sort of packing before, so I could well be doing this wrong. But as with all such challenges, there's only one way to find out, and that's to give it a go. It's taken a bit of time, but I do eventually get the packing squeezed into the slot, although where the ends join, it probably could be a little bit better. Getting the pistons with the packing into the cylinder bores is also a bit fiddly, but I'm sure my years of messing around with motorcycle engines helps. I do use a screwdriver to help coerce the packing over the edge, being careful not to score either the piston or the cylinder block. Once in, the pistons do at first seem very tight, but they do loosen up. I suspect as any of the bits of packing that may have been stuck between the piston circumference and cylinder bore get cleared away. To seal up the rear cylinder covers, first I fit the gaskets, which as you can see, I have notched for the area where the ports from the steam chest come through into the cylinder block. It is worth calling out that I've not yet cut the corresponding recesses into the inside of the cylinder covers, as I'll do that later on when I'm happy with the basic operation. With the gasket fitted, the cover is loosely bolted in place. I then installed the packing for the piston rod gland before fitting the gland cover. And then finally, I tighten down the cover bolts. The front covers are of course much simpler and just need to be bolted in place with the gaskets. With the cylinders now sealed up, the next job is to assemble the steam chests along with their associated gaskets, but I'll cover that off in the next video. I'll finish this one with a view of the left hand valve gear as I rotate the wheels. As can be seen from the radius rod and the expansion link, I do need to complete the linkage through from the reverser and then I should be very close to running on air. Thanks for watching.